Welcome to Women in the Word. We're so glad you're here with us. Will you stand and worship?
Good morning. Welcome to Women in the Word. 
Are you enjoying the spring weather? Isn't it wonderful? I love it. I just keep waiting for that 39 degree weather to hit again, and hopefully it's not going to do it. My name is Vanita Jones, and it's my great pleasure to be here today as we continue unpacking David's story that we find in 1 Samuel. You know, David's story has definitely been a story of ups and downs, twists and turns. And since the very first day we saw him way back in 1 Samuel 16, where he was anointed by Samuel to become the next king of Israel. Since that time, we've had this front row seat, and we've gotten to watch him do some amazing things. We've watched him go from this young lad where he was caring for his father's sheep all the way to where we are now in chapter 26 and 27, where he's this young man now taking care of like 600 men in their households. You know, during those years, David's had some major high points. I mean, think about Goliath. He was the town hero. He was Israel's hero after that. And he's had a lot of major low points. And most of them were as he was dodging Saul's spear over and over again. But throughout the last few weeks that we studied, we get to the end of the chapter, and I think, what could happen next? I think, it's not the end of David's story. There's so much more to come. I don't know about you, but knowing that David, a man after God's own heart, who got a lot of things right, he made some big old mistakes. I mean, some big ones. He didn't always get it right, and that gives me such great hope, such great hope. Because you know how many times I've tried to honor God with my life, and I just fall short. Sometimes I don't just fall short. I fall off a cliff from so far. And David has taught me, though, that those are going to happen. Those are those times that are going to come. There's going to be so much more to the story I'm living now. There's going to be times when it's going to be so amazing, and there's going to be so much joy. But guess what? There's going to be times when there's pain and immense sadness. And David has showed us how to do it. He teaches us to seek God often. He says, obey God's commands. And David always stayed teachable. I love that about him. You know, in fact, not just David, all of Scripture teaches us this. Look at the first three verses on your verse sheet. First Chronicles 16, 11 says, seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of ram. And Psalm 1 says, Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. So not just David's story, all of Scripture tells us how we can live a life that we would become women after God's own heart, just like David was a man after God's own heart. You know, roughly 23 years ago, Cameron and I, my husband, were coming out of a kind of a rough patch. Our daughter had been born, Khaki, our fourth, and during the first five months of her life, she went through more medical procedures, more medical tests, and surgeries than most of us go through in a lifetime. And we had spent those five months together making some really hard medical decisions about her care, about who to see her, who to treat her, and we were tired. And about seven months into her life, she was recovered from a major surgery, and we decided after the blessings from her doctor, we could take a road trip to our favorite place on earth, and that's Colorado. So we decided we'd do it. We also thought that taking four kids under the age of 10 and two children, two of those children under the age of two on a road trip, that we could be hopeful. <laughs> that we could be hopeful for a vacation. Let me tell you, we weren't only very hopeful, we were very naive. Very naive. Let me give you just a brief description of this trip. Day, the day before the trip, we should have known things were going to go differently than we thought. The day before, our Suburban, which fit our family nicely, broke down. So that found us packing four kids, two babysitters, and Cameron and I and all of our stuff into my in-law's minivan. It was difficult. 
In the 14 hours that it took to get to our destination, everyone in that car, except for Cameron and I, had thrown up at, Jesus, at least once. <laughs> at least once. It was horrible. And over the next nine days, because of altitude sickness, we had roughly 24 hours during that time, that if you put all these minutes together, that we were able to enjoy the scenery, the crisp mountain air. <laughs> And then we were packing up to head home again. That trip home was even worse. Because we missed a turn, and we added two hours to the agonizing 14-hour trip. And at the climax of that trip home, we found ourselves, Cameron and I, hosing our sweet baby girl off, because she's covered in diarrhea, in a parking lot of a gas station in Eagles Nest, New Mexico. It is forever burned into our brains. It was probably one of the lowest points in our entire married life. (laughs) To say that we were weary is an understatement. See, we were so confident just a few days ago. We were determined to have this amazing trip. And here we are just 10 days later, and we are completely disheartened. Completely disheartened that we weren't able to get out from that stress. I have to believe that that's where we see David here in 26 and 27. Because instead of just a few months of stress and a 10-day trip, David had been under stress for for years and years, like seven years, they believe. In fact, that's where we find him here today. He's still under the gun. He's being chased by Saul. I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Samuel 26, and I'm going to read just the first four verses. Now, when I get through these verses, you're going to be so glad that I didn't call on one of you to read it, okay? So I spent two hours trying to learn how to say all of these words. Okay, it says, Then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is is not David hiding himself on the hill in Hecala, which is under the east of Jeshimon? So Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph with 3,000 chosen men of Israel to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul encamped on the hill at Hecala which is beside the road on the east of Jeshimon. But David remained in the wilderness when he saw that Saul came after him with no, within, into the wilderness. David sent out spies and learned that Saul had indeed come. Okay, chapter 26 opens with David once again in an attempt to get away from Saul. He's running away. And verse 1 records that the Ziphites, now I'm not sure about this, but I'm starting to think that this Ziphite word is an ancient word for the word busybodies. Because it's, la- it's not the first time we've seen this. Right? This is at least the second time they rat him out to, to Saul. And they go to him and they say, David is, is currently hiding in the wilderness. And you need to go there. That's where he is. And on a side note, the Ziphites were from Caleb, who is from the tribe of Judah. The same one that David's from. You'd think they would have been a little bit more loyal to David, who's from the tribe of Judah, but not, of course not. And we see Saul at this point, he does what he does best. He gathers 30,000 of his best men to do a two-man job. And he moves away and heads over to the hill to find him. And let's pick up in verse 5. Let's see. Uh, David surmises he's there, and he sends out these spies to check on it. Let's read from 5 to 12. Then David arose and came to the place where Saul had encamped, and David saw the place where Saul lay with Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of his army. Saul was lying within the encampment, and while the army was encamped around him, then David said to Ahimelech, Ahimelech, the Hittite, and Joab, his brother of Abishai, the son of Zeriah, who would go down with me into the camp to Saul. And Abishai said, I will go with you. So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there lay Saul with sleeping within the encampment with his spear stuck in the ground at his head, and Abner and the army lay around him. Then Abishai said to God, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Now please let me pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spear, and I will not strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down in battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I put out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but take now the spear that is at his head and the jar of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the jar of water from Saul's head and went away. 
No man saw it or knew it or did anything or any awake, for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. Now, before we go on, I just want to mention briefly that we talked about this in your questions. This is not the same situation as what happened before. It's recorded of three main things, or the location. One was in the En Gedi. This time he was in a cave. This one he's in a camp here. Um, secondly, Saul was, was what Saul was doing. The first time he was relieving himself in that cave. This time he's asleep in the middle of the camp. And the third thing is that what's, what David took. It was that piece of his robe. This time he's got the spear and the water canteen. Though we don't see it recorded, most believe that God had probably instructed David to do this because we see in verse 12 that God helped him by putting these men to sleep so that they could get in there safely. Even Abner was asleep, and he would be directly in charge of uh, protecting King Saul. So, so deep was this sleep that, that David and Abishai were able to get into the center of the camp right where he would have been sleeping, and nobody saw it. And that would have been the best place. They would have kept him right in the middle of all these 3,000 men. Because when they camped, they'd put the, the king in the middle, and then they would surround him all the way out, like a big wheel, and he would be protected from animals or enemies or whatever it was. And when David finds Saul next to Abner, he also sees that spear. And he knows that spear. It's been thrown at him more than once or twice. And, he, and next to him, he sees that water canteen, and both of these would have been very important to the king. Both were his protection and his provision. And Abishai sees this as the perfect opportunity to take Saul out once and for all and rid him from their lives. But see, where Abishai was attempting to discern, discern God's will through his circumstances, he was looking at what was in, in front of him. David, on the other hand, has learned to not do that. He's learned in all these lessons God's given him, he's learned to interpret God's will through looking in light of God's character and God's word. He doesn't look at his circumstances to discern the will. He looks at God to discern his circumstances. And then just a short time ago, if you remember, David learned this again. It was when Nabal was put to death. He had learned that, that God would take care of that. It was God's timing. He knew to not only trust God, he knew to trust God's timing. And we know that because of what he tells Abishai. He says, as surely as the Lord lives, the Lord himself will strike him. His time will come and he will die. See, David knew that Saul's life would end exactly at the time God wanted it and exactly the time God declared it would happen. But it would not be at the hand of David. He knew that part for sure. Let's continue. I'm going to pick up in 13 and read to 20. Then David went over to the other side and stood far off on the top of the hill with a great space between them. And David called to the army and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Will you not answer, Abner? Then answer, Abner answered, Who are you who calls to the king? And David said to Abner, Are you not a man who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not kept watch over your lord, the king? For one of the people came in to destroy the king, your lord. This thing that you have done is not good. As the lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not kept watch over your lord, the lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and the jar of water that was at his head. Saul recognized David's voice and he said, Is, is this your voice, my son, David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, why does my Lord pursue after his servant? What have I done? What evil is on my hands? Now, therefore, let my Lord the king hear the words of this, his servant. If it is the Lord who has stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. But if it's man, may they be cursed before the Lord. For they have driven me out of this, on this day that I should not share in the heritage of the Lord, saying, go serve other gods." Now, therefore, let my, not my blood fall to the earth away from the presence of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. Now, because God had put Saul and his 3,000 men in that deep sleep, David and Abishai were able to escape, and they take the spear, the water canteen, and they head to a hill that was a distance away, but it would have been close enough that he could have turned around and called out. And from the safety of that hill, David just lays in to Abner. He calls out to him and says, Abner, 
Why aren't you doing your job? And then he, te- he tells him to look for Saul's water can, look for his spear. And I'm sure he's holding them up. And he says, go look and see that these are those, that the same ones that were by his head just a few minutes ago. You know, I can't imagine the fear that had to come over Abner when he saw those. And he knew they were missing because that meant he hadn't done his job. And it most likely would have cost him his life because he had failed to carry out his duties. David's voice then awakens Saul, and Saul immediately recognizes David's voice. And he calls him, my son. But David doesn't return with my father like he used to do because, remember, we were told he's not his son-in-law anymore. Remember that we heard that, that Saul had taken Michal away from David and given, him to another, given her to another man in marriage. So he was no longer going to be addressing him as my father. But he does something that I thought was interesting. He says, my Lord, O king. I mean, how hard is that? That was the, that was the term that you would use for your king, to show respect and honor to the king. I mean, think about this. He's having to show, he's showing respect. He's not have to. He made the choice to show respect to this king who had been trying to kill him for seven years. That was amazing to me. It's, it's a king who he knew was, had a kingdom that was very short-lived. He also knew that he was going to be the one that took over the throne from him, and yet he showed respect to him. And I think he was able to do that because he was secure in his own identity because he was secure in God's promises and, his, and God's plans for his future. He trusted God with that. See, being able to trust God in his ups and downs, it allowed David to respond to King Saul with honor and respect because David knew when he did that, ultimately, he was respecting and honoring God. And that's what really mattered to David. It meant more to him than his own feelings, his hard feelings towards Saul. He's definitely not that young boy and is watching over his dad's sheep anymore. He's maturing into this man who is obeying God. And he's learned to look at all his circumstances through his, the lens of God's character. He knows God's character, and it's helped him trust God's plans for his future. And by doing so, he honors God even when it's difficult and even when it doesn't feel good. And then he proceeds to plead his case before Saul and, then, and all of Saul's men. I think he really wanted Saul's men to hear this. In front of those men, David questioned Saul's motives. He asked him, is this something God has asked you to do? I mean, have I missed something over these seven years? Is, is God asked you to do this? Because if so, let me make an offering so I can make amends and we can go, get past this. And then he says, or is it these guys around you? Are these people stirring you up? Because if it is, then may they be cursed. But they're causing the king of Israel to sin. You know, I imagine um, at this point, David's speech was filled with emotion. I just imagine it, you know, he's battle-weary. He's got to be mentally and physically exhausted from not, he's, from not only being on the run, but remember he's looking after these 600 men and their households. You know, the part that's recorded is 600 men. The part that's not said is that that would have been their households, been wives, their children, their extended families most likely, and then all their animals, their livestock, some actually believe there would have been 3,000-plus with him and all the livestock that would have been with them. So imagine that stress. Imagine the stress of overseeing all this, making sure everybody's cared for and taken care of in the wilderness these year, all these years, all the time fearing for your life, day and night for seven years. See, I think that David's plea at this point was more like an Oscar-worthy performance if we could have heard it. And he just wanted Saul to stop the madness. He's weary. Let's look at Saul's response to David as recorded in 20 through 25. Or 21 through 25. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do you harm, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly and made a great mistake. And David answered and said, Here is the sparrow king, 
Let one of the young men come over and take it. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I will not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Behold, as your life is precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord, and may he deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be you, my son David. You will do many things and will succeed in them. So David went his way, and Saul returned to his place. You know, these are the last recorded words between two of God's anointed, between Saul, the current king of Israel, and David, the future king of Israel. And as every other conversation has gone between them before, Saul's words are completely self-focused, and they lack any acknowledgement of God. And David, his are filled with God. He acknowledges God in every way, and he has very little self-focus in it. You know, Saul confessed his sin to David, but we never see him mention that he sinned against God. He's, he's gone to, to David and said, I've sinned. I've, I've made a mistake. He never goes that next step. And that's what true repentance is, is taking that st- next step. Confessing our wrongs to God is where true repentance starts. It's actually saying, I didn't just sin against that person. I sinned against you. And it helps you root out the cause of that sin that sometimes we continue to repeat over and over again. Something's causing it in the root. David, on the other hand, had learned that when he had sinned, he wasn't just sinning against man, he was sinning against God. And that was most important to him. And he knew that his circumstances and his response to those circumstances were a whole lot less about his relationship with Saul and had everything to do with his relationship with God. I, know, I don't know about you, but the end of this chapter was kind of sad to me. You know, at any time, Saul could have turned and repented to God. I mean, we have a very merciful God. He's very gracious. You're, he, we know that we're never too far, far from that turn, that we can turn and repent. He, he may not have been returned to the, being the king forever or for his lifetime and his family, but he might have been maybe a wise counsel to the future king. He would have at least been honoring God by doing it, but his pride would never allow him to do that. Scripture tells us that when we repent, our Heavenly Father responds with mercy and grace. Second Chronicles 30 on your verse sheet says, For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him. And look at Proverbs 28, 13. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. But he, will, he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Sadly, Saul just could not get there. He couldn't put aside his pride and repent, and his lifetime became a disaster. His entire life became a disaster because of it. But not David. David just doesn't survive his, his hard circumstances. He looks at those circumstances through the lens of God's truth and and the lens of what he knows about God's character. And and in his determination to honor God, it helped him thrive in his difficult circumstances. And like David, the same for us. Our faith will be strengthened when we determine to look at our circumstances through the lens of God's truth. Not just bad circumstances, even our good circumstances. When we do this, it gives us proper perspective. And when we do it, we become, even, we become more concerned about our relationship with our Heavenly Father during our circumstances, good or bad, than we are about the circumstances themselves. I want to begin reading 1 Samuel 27, starting at verse 1. And I'm going to read to verse 4. Then David said in his heart, Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines, then Saul will despair of seeking me in any, any longer with the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. So David arose and went over, and he and his 600 men who were with him, to Achish, the son of Moak, and king of Gath. And David lived with Achish by Gath, at Gath, and he and his men, every man in his household, and David with his two wives. And when it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer sought him. <clears throat> You know, there are two things that Cameron and I learned on that trip 23 years ago. The first thing we learned on that trip is that when you're traveling with young children, you never call it a vacation. (laughs) You always call it a trip. Because that's when your expectations might be met. 
You just lower your expectations right from the beginning. Secondly, we learned another really important lesson. We learned that the journey from being determined to being completely disheartened takes roughly the same amount of time to rinse the diarrhea off your daughter (laughs) in a parking lot in New Mexico. That's what it was for us. You know, to say that that was a low point, like I said earlier, in that parking lot is an understatement, and every decision we made after that moment was very questionable. In fact, most of the decisions we made of the remainder of that trip were bad. Just a couple were just how we talked to each other. We weren't very kind. How we responded to our children was not very kind. How we responded to the 400th clerk at the convenience store because we made another stop to go to the bathroom. Our attitudes were horrible, and our actions were not God-honoring, not in the very least. In David's case, the journey from determined to disheartened, it took the time about it took for us to read one Bible verse. It can happen really quickly. David, a man after God's own heart, who did a lot of stuff right, one verse later, he's disheartened. That tells me it can happen to any of us. You know, uh, we traveled from the end of chapter 26. We saw him so determined. He was so determined, I'm not going to kill God's anointed. He was even given multiple times to do it, and he didn't do it. And now we get to 27, and we see him so disheartened that in that state, he makes the bad decision to move into Philistine territory. He literally ran right into the enemy's arms because he was so disheartened with his circumstances. Saul had promised. I think he had his hand behind him, his fingers crossed somewhere, because he did it so many times. And David, of course, in God's discernment, knew that he would not. He would not stop doing it. So he moved into enemy territory, and he set up camp. Not only did he move, though, we read he took all 3,000-plus people and all their animals and went there as well. They traveled west to the city of Gath, and he encounters King Achish. It's not the first time he's encountered King Achish. The last time he did it was back in chapter 21. He actually left there in fear, ran to King Achish. This is kind of a repeat performance here. That time, he ended up acting like a madman, if you remember that, and kind of stayed under the radar. So um, this time, he's running away in fear again, I believe. And verse 1 leads us to believe that that fear also was laced with some weariness and disheartened. In David's disheartened state, he had started to look at his circumstances through the lens of his weariness and fear instead of through what he knew to be true about God and God's Word. And at surface level, it almost looks like it worked. Because, I mean, verse 4 says Saul never tried to kill him again. I think it says a lot more about Saul than it does about David, though. Because I think Saul was only willing to to go after David when it was easy, and he was kind of the top dog in the hunt. He had his 3,000 men with him. This time, he would be running into Philistine territory, their mortal enemies, and um, he knew that he would probably uh, become the hunted, just like David was the hunted as well. So I guess in light of that, David's decision was a little okay, maybe. But where David was more concerned about his own safety, God was most concerned and had been concerned about using David's circumstances to prepare him to be a man of God and take over the throne. So it, I think maybe running away in fear, Saul might have, or David might have missed out on some important lessons. But we'll never know. We don't know. He might have missed out on some blessings as well. We'll never know because now he's with the enemy. And let's continue. Let's read verse 5, and I'm going to read all the way to the end. Then David said to Achish, If I have found favor in your eye, let a place be given me in one of your country towns that I may well dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So that day Achish gave him Ziklag. Therefore Ziklag was, has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. And the number of the days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. Now David and his men went out up and made raids against the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. For these were the inhabitants of the land of old, as far as sure to the land of Egypt. And David would strike the land and would leave neither man nor woman alive, but would take away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camel, and the garments, and come back to Achish. 
When Achish asked, where have you made a raid today? David would say, in Judah, the Jeremelites or the Kenites. And David would leave neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, saying, lest they should tell about us and say, so David has done. Such has, was his custom all the while he lived in the country of the Philistines. And Achish trusted David, thinking, he has made himself an utter stench to his people Israel. Therefore, he shall always be my servant. You know, I want to give you a little background into some of this, these cities, a little information about each one of them, and then just a brief synopsis of what David was up to during this period of time that he lived in Philistine territory. Knowing this is going to help you better understand what he was thinking, there were five principal cities, uh, Philistine cities, and each one had its own king, and Gath was known as a royal city. So it was kind of a main seat of power, and Achish, the king of Gath, was the king there, he, we know he knows David. He's run across him before. Um, so, you know, we even, we even see some other places where his servants refer to David as the king of the land of Judah. So they knew who David was. I'm sure his, his uh, reputation preceding him. So because of this, pro David probably knew that they were going to be keeping a close eye on him for the most part. He was going to be hard for him to fly under the radar inside of Gath. So uh, he has a strategic move to plan and to plan a move to another city and he hopes to plan uh, to strengthen Israel by doing so. Now it's hard to say for sure if his move was a plan that was approved by God but um, we're not really given much information we kind of have to go with what we have here but I kind of lean to the fact that he probably um, he had made that plan while he got to Gath after he got to Gath. It wasn't a plan he went into Philistine territory with. I think he came up that once he got there. I don't know exactly why I came to that, but it's kind of what I feel. Um, David was a smart guy, and I think he would have come up with the plan once he got there. Now, Ziklag was a city situated in the Negev, but its exact location is unknown. Now, I have a map I want to show you. If you'll put it up. You can see Gath up there. It's unknown. It's one of the two in there. Most likely, most people believe it's the one to the right that would be, the right, would be the one that we're speaking of. But way back when Joshua was handing out land, when they first got to the promised land, he gave that city, the city of Ziklag, to Simeon, who was from the tribe of Judah. Now, the same tribe that David's from. But during that time, they never fully occupied it. They never fully conquered that city. So it was always an issue. And, and that is possibly why... Um, Maybe the reason that King Achish felt like he had some power in this city, that he could actually give it to David. So because of this, uh, the Israelites had lived in that area. They were always in constant conflict with the surrounding Philistine strongholds, as well as within the city of Ziklag. Now, David made this plan. I don't know if it was God's plan or David's plan. It's hard to know for sure. But we do get a hint that whether it was God's plan initially or not, God actually brought something good out of it because verse 6 records that from the time that David moved into Ziklag, that city became fully occupied and stayed in Judah's control from there on. So that was accomplished for sure. Now, how did he do this? Again, David had one thing that he ran to when he was kind of running, run, kind of rogue, and that was deception. And that's what he used here. It's kind of questionable. His deceit uh, not only was deceit for the king. It also caused a lot of human life lost. Lots of people were killed in this. But here's what he did. He conducted raids against the Philistine strongholds. And you see them here. If you put the map back up, I'm sorry, there. Um, it's the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Melekites. Okay, you see them. Those were still Palestine strongholds where Palestinians lived there. Okay? But, what he, but when he would go to um, Achish, he would say well, I'm raiding Judah and the Jeremelites and the Kenites. Now, Jeremelites, they're actually descendants of Judah. And, and they're obviously friends of Judah. And the Kenites are descendants of Cain, but they were on really good terms with the Israelites and especially with the tribe of Judah. In fact, when David becomes king, the Kenites actually are incorporated into the tribe of Judah. So those, these weren't the bad guys. He wasn't actually fighting them, but that's who King Achish thought he was fighting. He was warring against them. Actually, he was, 
taking out the Palestinians over here. And when he did, he took out every man, woman, and child. He didn't want one mouth to get back to David that could tell them what he had been doing. So instead of human captives, David took the spoils of the battles, all the stuff he got out, the garments, the livestock, everything. He'd go back to Achish and he'd hand it to him and say, look what I did for you. And he stayed in King Achish's good graces. I don't know, was it David's plan? Was it God's plan? It's not clear. Sometimes when I have plans that don't seem clear, it probably means it's not God's plan. It's usually pretty obvious. Hard to know for sure, but we, from what we do learn in the last verse of chapter 27, David's deceit accomplished what he had desired, at least. Not sure that it was what God had desired from the beginning, but David seems to hit his goal because Achish trusts him. But Achish also wrongly, wrongly assumes that David has become a stench to his own people, and he hasn't. Now, there are a couple different camps on whether David was making a good or bad strategic move. Um, The most popular camp, though, agrees that it was a bad move. At first, I did not like that. I have to be honest, I like David. I like David a lot, enough to rationalize every bad thing he was doing to this point. And, but I had to keep studying it, I had to keep pondering, I had to keep praying on it, and this is how I came to that decision, that it was a bad decision. I was thinking about David's character. When we look back to what we knew about him from chapter 16 to where we are now, I looked at David's character, and I knew that he had made so many good decisions, he had had so much success, and all of that recorded in those 10 chapters leading up to this, it helped me understand that this move to Gath was not was not the norm for him. He didn't typically just run into the enemy's arms like this. You know, in fact, the other time we see him doing this, going rogue, I mentioned it, chapter 21, it's when multiple priests were killed. He went into uh, uh, some priests, deceived them, and because of the deception, all but one of the priests and Nob were killed at Saul's hand and um, caused a lot of human life to be lost. Even knowing this, I was still trying to rationalize, you know, I could see David. He was trying to do, he was trying to help God out. I help God all the time. (laughs) But I want to share a couple things that God pointed out to me as I continue to study. In chapters, in the chapters to this point, so what I'm talking about is 12 chapters, starting at 16 and all the way to 27 where we are today. The shortest two chapters in those 12 chapters Chapter 21, there's 15 verses. Chapter 27, there's 12 verses. I also noted in both those, and I had you look at this, at least for 26 and 27, that in both of those chapters, 21 and 27, God is never mentioned. Not one time. I took those two things and I put them together, and it led me to believe that David makes questionable decisions that often for him involved deceit when he's not walking closely with God. Purely speculation on my part, but also from experience in my life. It's when I make questionable decisions as well. And although chapter 27 ends with David seeming living quite well in the wing of, under the wing of the enemy, the next few chapters we're going to see that David's poor decision to escape to the enemy is going to create an unthinkable problem for him. It's one where he is going to be faced with battling against his own people, the Israelites. You know, as I've said along, this isn't the end of David's story. There's so much more to come. And before we get all judgy, because I know what we want to do when you go, how can a man like David? He's a man after God's own heart. Why? How would he do something like that? It makes no sense. I just have to turn the mirror around and ask myself that same question. Because I'll be honest, I can rationalize my poor decisions with the best of them. In fact, if that was, if rationalizing poor decisions was a spiritual gift, it would be mine. (laughs) Thank goodness it's not. He doesn't want us to do that. You know, I don't, 
I don't know about you, but during periods of prolonged agony and stress and, and just where things are not easy, I begin to think there's no hope. Surely God's not going to answer my prayer, or at least he's not answering in my way, in my timing. What is he doing? I often find myself moving from being very determined to honor him in everything I do to being completely disheartened. And when this happens, my walk with God is affected. I don't want to be with him as much. I don't want to talk to him as much. Sometimes I can't even form the words to talk to him. And I can tell you it's during those times I make the worst decisions. I just wonder if that's where David was in the end of chapter 26 and going into chapter 27. It's hard to know for sure. We don't have a lot of information. Remember, it's the shortest chapter in this area. And I can tell you for certain that it's during the times like David, during difficult times, I make questionable decisions that are always based on fear and hopelessness and not on what I know to be true about God's character. You know, walking closely with God allows us to see his character and avoid making decisions based on our hopelessness and fear. And looking back, and when I reflect on those difficult situations when I wasn't walking right alongside God, you know what I learned? God never walked away from me. Not in the least. In fact, he just did his best work. He just kept on doing what he promises he would do. And when I think about it, it saddens me. Because I can tell you I've missed some really important lessons because I didn't walk closely with him. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to take more field trips to to learn them. And I really don't want to do that. But I've also bet I've missed some blessings when I wasn't walking with him. You know, but God in his mercy, when I make those bad decisions and I go rogue, he has been faithful to continue to do his work, not because of my faithfulness but because of his great faithfulness. Look at 1 John 1, 9 on your verse sheet. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I don't know about you, but I am more than grateful that I serve a God that is faithful to forgive even when I'm not faithful to him. Please pray with me. Father, you um, you are our faithful God. You never walk away from us. Father, so many times we go out on our own and try to figure it out. And Father, you are so gracious and merciful that you protect us and you teach us and you help us come back with lessons and blessings that we can apply to the rest of our lives. Lord, I pray that we be women that become women after your own heart because that's where we're safe, Father, is under your wing. We love you. We love your word. And it's Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Vanita. Ladies, we hope you have enjoyed this study as much as we have. We have just a few weeks left of Bible study, and we would love to hear from you about your experience at Women in the Word. Evaluations were emailed out Tuesday, so please fill those out and get them back to us. If you are looking for a mentor, we have several women who would love to pair with you and meet with you. Our mentoring ministry side-by-side will pair you with another woman who would love to walk alongside with you and pray for you. You can go to Christ Chapel website, or we can answer questions about mentoring um, at the welcome desk after Women in the Word. Thanks, ladies. Hope you have a great week.